Hello. Hi, folks. Hello. Hello. How's it going for you? Busy. <laughs> yeah. Lots of stuff to do, things to take care of. Oh, I feel you. I'll be on holidays for for the next couple of weeks. Start, nice. Starting from Monday, and yeah, I'm just going. I'm just trying to wrap everything up. <laughs> for this yeah. Thing. But yeah, want to have a good handover, right, for the other folks involved. Exactly. <laughs> How is everything on your side? Yeah, somewhat, somewhat same. Um, I have, I think I have like two, two and a half weeks to go until like late summer vacation, almost like autumn vacation this year. Um, but yeah, hopefully trying to get everything done in time. Good stuff. <clears throat> All right, let's give it a few more minutes for Fox to join. I posted the, the meeting doc in chat. I'll do it, I don't know, a few more times as folks are joining in. I don't think that, that Zoom shows the history, right, when you join us. So. <clears throat> There we go. Um, I hope you can see my screen. I should show the relevant Google Doc for this meeting right now. So hello, everyone. Just a reminder, that this meeting is uh, being recorded and it will be posted to YouTube shortly after. Um, just as a side note, I checked the YouTube channel. It seems to be only sporadically getting updates. Uh, not, not sure. I, I think I will post this like later. Um, if there's some issue we need to fix. Um, yeah, by joining um, these meetings, uh, you agree to abide by the Cloud Native Security Code of Conduct, uh, which can be found in the CNCF repository. Uh, it would be great if one person or even two persons uh, would volunteer as scribes. Um, I posted the Google Doc. Um, just fill in your name, their columns, any, any notes would be appreciated so I don't have to talk and type at the same time. Um, yeah, for existing members, um, workgroup reps and so on, please remember to include your name, your org, and any updates. <clears throat> okay, first first item, any, any new members, any new joiners who would like to say hello, talk a bit about themselves, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Daniel Crook. I'm, I just joined the CNCF as staff, so I've been kind of joining each of the TAG meetings where I can to learn awesome. about what folks are working on. And so my role is to improve developer, contributor, maintainer experience. Uh, mm -hmm. So helping hopefully make your lives easier, better, smoother. Um, so just glad to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining. Great to have you. Thank you. All right, I think I see any uh, everyone else before. So let's continue uh, with the next point, uh, which would be to have a look at the currently open issues, uh, stuff that needs trash. Um, I have not seen any any updates uh, in the last week. Uh, the only new issue I, I saw was the bank 
Vault's introduction. I have not heard of this um, tool before. Not sure if anyone has some background information here. Um, so this issue was opened as part of the presentation or submitting as a sandbox application. And it seems to be some secret management solution focused on HashiCorp Vault. So I'm excited to learn more about this in, in future meetings. Um, so they suggested they could, could hold a presentation August 20th. So if this topic is interesting to you, make sure to, to mark this in your calendars. All right, any points to that? If not, we can continue. I guess with uh, the meetings overlapping, who who offers the uh, the intro talk? The US or the EMEA meeting? Uh, first come, first serve, right? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next again, the agenda point uh, would be to have a quick review of the meeting in the other time zone. So as you know, like. European meeting is every two weeks, I think. So we have two um, NA tech meetings that took place. Um, last week, last week's meeting uh, in the NA time zone had a presentation by Nathan Brams. So he's from P0 um, Security. And he presented on something they call the IAM Privilege Catalog, which is basically um, so the website is not linked here, but I have it somewhere. Yeah, it's like a, a catalog of all the ro roles um, you, you find in, in cloud providers. I think he mentioned he, he, they started with, with Google Cloud, but they would definitely extend to other clouds in future. So this allows you to understand like what permissions do roles grant you in the specific clouds, and then they want to map this to risks and services so you can better understand your your risk profile when you, for example, have a profile attached to a user, uh, you will learn um, how powerful they are with these permissions, which is not always clear from the cloud provider documentation to say to say the least. The varying degrees of documentation out there for different clouds. Um, again, I'm not I'm not sure where the um, recording is of this meeting, but the presentation was great. Um, seems to be very keen on, on getting some feedback. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, I think Nathan would be very open to, to your comments or questions. Yeah. All right, any points to that? Have you heard of this project before? Okay, so as I said, if you want an introduction, uh, I, I will make sure to find a recording if available. So next one would be uh, meeting updates. Does any of the participants have an update? I see mostly no updates. Uh, Daniel, you gave us a short intro. Uh, Jack or Alien, would you do you have any update points? I don't. Nope. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we can also have this very short. I don't see any reps uh, currently for audio supply chain and so on. If you do have any project updates, let me know. If not, we can go to the next agenda point. I was sort of wondering actually, are there any updates on the cube flow toolkit? Is there any progress on that? Uh, let me check. Whoa. That's not what I wanted to do. All right. No, so it's not on the project board. So you find it in the issues. It is in the issues, yes. About a security review of Kubeflow. Yeah. yeah. So the issue itself doesn't seem to have any updates. Mm. Oh, yesterday. Yeah, I think this is for Andy to to align to get this this picked up. Um, are you asking just just 
general interest or would you like to, I don't know, contribute? It's just out of general interest and what like um, Okay. I, I, I don't know of any updates here. Sorry? I don't have anything specific in mind. Yeah. Okay. To be honest, I just volunteered for this security review. And I was wondering at uh, what stage this review is um, relevant. Ah, oh, okay, perfect. Um, I will make sure to to ping Andy um, after this meeting so we can get this back on track. I'm not sure how these oh, yes. are usually distributed, but in, in general, I think if you have some spare time, just reading the doc and leaving comments is, is always appreciated to get it started or push it forward. Sounds good. All right. Okay, if there are no other points, um, my idea was to use this meeting today, mostly as a working session, to have a look at the Zero Trust white paper. Um, let me know if you want to discuss anything else first. Um, if not, yeah, you yeah, have this, this long running issue about the Zero Trust initiative in the tax security. and. Yeah, we have this this document, which is currently in the review phase, uh, which the goal is to basically summarize what is zero trust, like define it in the first place, but then also provide some best practices on how to implement this with cloud native technologies and, and principles in mind. So if you don't know all that much about the topic uh, yet, uh, I think the document does a great job of introducing you to the topic as well. So maybe we can have a look at that first and basically use this as a like common definition to talk about zero trust. So as we learn in the introduction, zero trust is a collection of concepts, architectures, and cybersecurity to enforce accurate, least privileged, behavior-based, per request access decisions in the face of cloud systems viewed as already compromised. So this is a like packed sentence, um, but I think it mentions a lot of the terms that are important to understand zero trust. Um, what do you think about this this first sentence? I think it does a good job at like introducing uh, the reader to this topic. So you have this part here viewed as already compromised, which I think is a, is a critical assumption to have, right? So if we talk about zero trust and like securing the communication between different services, um, one of the very big points is that we, we don't trust the cloud provider to be like a safe zone. Like we need to assume that it's already compromised. And it also continues to, to explain this, right? We assume that the cloud provider parameter cannot be properly protected. It's just too big, like big cloud providers have a lot of money to spend on security, but in the end, one vulnerability is enough to have an entry point for an attacker. So it explains a lot more about the background on like where zero trust is coming from, but I would like to uh, have a look at maybe a section that has not that many comments. So maybe we can provide a new a new, new input to this document. Um, so it starts to introduce the principles of zero trust, which is basically like breaking up this, this first sentence. What does it mean in detail? So we have the principles of zero trust. As we mentioned, we have to assume a breach, but not just a breach of the cloud provider of basically any aspect of the system and we want to have an answer for that eventually first we need to define the principles so we assume every image that we deploy that we use to build upon includes a vulnerability i i think this is a fair fair assumption to me the second point is we assume that every service is vulnerable. And he asked myself the question, like, what is the difference between image and service? Um, I feel the distinction is not quite clear. A service like a third party service I'm consuming, or is it a service I'm 
I'm developing on my own, maybe based on like a base image. Um, do you see the same points that the user might be confused here or how do you understand these two sections in, in relation? I see that as we said, it's not very clear. However, what I understand is that uh, like the service provided by whatever image is running, whether it's an API or anything else, I don't know. Yeah, I think the term service is quite overloaded, right? You could imagine like the cloud service provider yeah. <laughs> and maybe even just a single service in that cloud or maybe even an external service you're yeah, depending on, right? Maybe you, I don't know, integrate with zero hours, something that is not part of the cloud you're running in. The first two bullets are very similar, right? So, so understanding why somebody felt the need to write the same, what looks to be the same statement twice. Yes. Would, would would be good just to get some yeah. clarity from the author. So maybe they're trying to tease something out that we don't quite yes. follow. That's a good point. Um, how does it does this, this. All right. The next point is assume that every service will be exploited sometimes or at some time. This is basically the next step in the chain, right? So we have vulnerable images, we have vulnerable services. So at some point, someone will come along and actually use that vulnerability and exploit our service. also talks about like these are not air gapped right usually we need to provide like a service to like customers to users uh, so we need to make this available somehow and this can usually also be used by by attackers to find an entry point so next point is like even closer to home. So I assume the cluster network is hostile and untrusted. Um, I feel this has a totally different scope than the three bullet points before, right? These are pretty generic and they don't even clearly define the environment they're talking about. And a cluster network already feels like very Kubernetes specific. I'm not sure if you should take that leap because it could, you could also have like a cloud native application that is not deployed in Kubernetes, but is using like some framework the cloud provider provides you. So you also shouldn't trust that that, that network. Let's just have a comment like that's that was certainly good. Um, the provider itself, the virtual private cloud, they, they provide you and maybe there are other layers of abstraction. All right. Anything else that comes to mind and like components that could be breached? and are not included in those four bullet points. I'm not sure if we want to talk maybe about rogue users with like valid credentials and they do something they're not supposed to be doing. Maybe they got a lot of money to do something bad. I'm not sure if this is in the scope. How do we call this scenario usually? Uh, 
valid users over there permissions to users being bribed and denied for example. All right, next bullet point, uh, always verify and never trust. So this zero trust tenor translates into three aspects. You have to eliminate implicit trust, minimize explicit trust, and continually verify the trust. So first bullet point, eliminate implicit trust is always authenticate the service and always authenticate the service service request sender. That's a particular <laughs> structure. Like service consumer, would that be clearer? For me, I'm kind of thrown off by this request sender construction. Okay. So internal as well as external clients need to verify the identity of any service approached. So basically, don't disable the SSL verification, right? Which we never do. Um, yes, the internal cluster network is also hostile. Hence, even internal clients need to authenticate the services and protect against man-in-the-middle attacks on the internal network, right? And then on the other side, verify the identity of any request sender, either cluster internal or external to any service. Yes, the internal cluster network is also hostile. I think this ties back to what we had here, right? Um, just with the last one, always authenticate the service. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's stating the internal cluster is hostile, whereas pretty much everything else is said assume is it's hostile yeah that line there yeah it, says a point. it is hostile yeah um maybe we can just suggest this directly assume i can keep this right assume this uh it might need tweaking a bit because uh, it's got the like yes part at the start. So it might be, uh, yes, we should consider the internal cluster network is also hostile. That's a good point. Oh. Um, how do we fix this? Let's assume the internal cluster network is also hostile. Does it work? Yep, that sounds fine. Um, and then I guess it's a question of tone, but um, yeah, does the rest of the document address the reader quite as directly? So this is a case where we're saying to the reader, yes, this is this is something yes, we want you to really pay notice to. That that that's a good point. Like the the tone is very different from the rest of the document. I haven't really read it in its entirety, but um, that's a good point. All right, let, let's skip to the bottom point because they switch the, the ordering here. The second point is minimize explicit trust and this comes at the bottom. So always authorize the service request using least privilege. 
<clears throat> and in the context of observed behaviors. Explicitly verify that this client is allowed to perform this operation against this service. In view of the observed behavior of the client, the service request and the service. I'm, I'm not sure if these are comments because they are like, do we really allow any untrusted identity to access all data and do anything? Or are these like questions posed to the user? I think they read like questions posed to the user in order to mm -hmm. emphasize the least privilege kind of principle. All right. So I think these are good questions to ask yourself, but maybe you can like, um, you know, you to make clear these are example questions to help the user think about their system. Um, and I have a question here. Should it be to do with observed behavior or intended behavior? So like when I think observed behavior, that would be where uh, I'm just going to keep the service. I'm going to see what it does and then just allow everything that it did over a period. Yeah. Whereas if I really want least privilege, I should know what it should do and only give it that. Yeah, that's a good point. This is more more like trust on first use, right? So if you yeah. exhibit malicious behavior from the get go, you, you're kind of good in, in that in that uh, mm -hmm. scenario. Um, uh, observed, but not malicious behavior to assist. It is the section, yeah. And she's angered by using the defined behavior. Yeah, defined or intended sound good to me. Yeah. Yeah, this, this feels like something, right? You could imagine like some sort of watchdog learning the status quo of a service and just assuming that this is good good behavior, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which scales a lot better than like manually tweaking things. You need a lot of manpower to do that but obviously it's less, less secure. All right, good stuff. So third point would be to continually verify the trust. Um, so we should always monitor service requests to verify that the request is as expected and requests are being used to exploit vulnerabilities in services. I'm thrown off by the monitor part. So monitor and verify are different things, right? Monitor is passive. Verification is somewhat more active without the enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're monitoring, you don't necessarily know what is good. Whereas if you're verifying, yeah, you do know what is good when, when looking. So monitor is passive listening and verify is relevant against, yeah, against the policy. Um, you, yeah, basically rich with them. And then the next point, always monitor the service behavior instead of the requests. 
So verify that the services are not being exploited. Services do get hacked, data does get stolen, offenders do use services to advance sinister intentions. Yes, so this sounds like anomaly detection, which mm. is fine. But yeah, I don't quite understand the bullet before. This one. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of a scenario where the request itself is something you need to think about separate to general behavior. Like if I have an API, I do a request, I get my response. You might call the whole thing the behavior of the service. So if I'm trying to think what's specifically unique about that bullet. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe if you're using, let's say, Nginx, and you've got stuff on top of Nginx, the behavior part would be what you've put on top. And the request part would be, well, it hasn't even got to your code yet it's got to nginx but i don't know if that's what they meant i'm trying yeah, it's, to work it's it out abstract that's true um let me just record So when I read this, my mind went to something like web application firewall at this point, where I just look at the payload and I try to I don't know, maybe strip out stuff like I have a matcher for J right. okay. kind of things. Makes sense. And this is like, all right, is my service allowed to like, I don't know, read the file system? Like I can strip the capability. Um, but if it still try, tries to do that, I would okay. still like to get alerted. But right. So like I might have got a malicious request that didn't actually do anything. So monitoring the request was part one. And yeah. the nothing bad happened is, is bullet two. Yes. Okay. So that's my interpretation, but I totally agree that you can read also the interpretation you mentioned. Um, I think which, which ties back to like the service thing is is poorly defined, right? Maybe we should have a distinction between like third party components, the stuff that I write. I can make this clear that maybe service is probably. So we should have a clear definition of a service is what our capabilities are in regards to it. So can we and we update it like a third party service? I cannot update that. <clears throat> All right. And then always monitor the client's behavior. That's the next point. Verify that the client behaves as expected. Identities do get hacked. So that was the point I tried to make earlier, right? What if like, an identity is used to carry out malicious things? Credentials get stolen and insiders may misbehave. Yeah, again, I feel like the, the term client is, is, is way overloaded in our industry. This could be an API client, but I think what they mean here is more like a thing with an identity. 
So either like a human or a machine. And we're just now consuming some other service. So I think that's the first time, right, they did this. So it was the service request sender, which they are now calling a client. Service is the service request sender from previous section. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Um, it's not really a comment on this section, but I was just trying to think if the client doing the request has an identity with least privilege. I was just trying to think about what behavior would be uh, anomalous, what behavior would be different to expected, because you would have your least privilege for, okay, well, this is what you should do, so you mm -hmm. should be allowed to. The only things that come to mind for, okay, you know, you're allowed to maybe delete users, so it's not weird that you're deleting users, but maybe it's weird that you're doing it from, uh, you know, Iran or something. Yeah, from like an unusual location. So, yeah. what if you attempt to do something you're not authorized to do? Right. Got it. Okay. So, you were still not allowed to do it, but you tried to do it, that kind yeah. of thing. You get a token and you start mm -hmm. trying to mm -hmm. understand what privileges that token has. Yes. Yeah. So I guess another thing would be like um, unexpected amounts of requests. Like, if this is only meant to be used by humans or whatever and it's like thousands a second stuff like that yeah i don't know oh. if there's a section further down that says what each of these bullet points kind of looks like and how you would uh how you would achieve them i don't think i've seen them i would just write them down here and if we find it we can just move the comment um but maybe in the same vein of like having these these example questions here, we could also like um, yeah, like the one examples. Problems. Yeah, right. This one. So we could provide some some questions. Um, is the geolocation. The same the amount of requests. Um, yeah, we actually talked about this in, in the last week's meeting in, in, in the NA meeting. Like, um, if you do critical operations, um, it might make sense to strip those permissions from a user um, and provide them in a dedicated role just for you to assume during the time you perform those critical operations, right? So if you think about like a backup job, for example, that usually runs on a schedule. So drop those permissions if you don't need them and only assume then when you run the backup job, um, the same we, we do in our day-to-day -day life, right? We hopefully don't run around as rude all the time, but we just assume it when we need it in time. Um, <clears throat> so this could be, I'm not sure if it's directly applicable, it's something we could mention later on. <clears throat> all right, any more points to this to this section? Another point I would like to raise here is this specific section, let's say, focuses on clients, vendors, identities, whatever they are. However, in the first section where we're talking about breaches, mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing related to potentially malicious intent of entities, 
users or anything like that. So I was just wondering whether we should, there should be added here, another section, uh, another bullet point saying, assume like malicious intent or That's a great point. About malicious intent, yeah. Assume potential yes. <laughs> malicious. Uh, intentions by valid users. Yeah. That's a good point. So, mostly covers machine to machine communication. There's the next section also includes human files. So we should assume a human, a human being breached. <laughs> that sounds good. Let's see if that yeah, that's a great point. That's definitely a difference in, in scope of these two sections. Perfect. So there's a lot more um, detail in the following sections, but maybe we can just skip to the end um, so we can go into the practical things, right? Um, they're now talking a lot of like zero trust components. But I think the, the good discussion points would be about like what are the best practices to achieve zero trust and, and, and what is out there that can be used to achieve it. <clears throat> and, and also there are little comments here yet. So I think people will be happy to, to get some feedback in these sections. <clears throat> so a guiding policy can be an advantage in and of itself, if it anticipates actions, reactions of others reduces the complexity and ambiguity of a situation by exploiting leverage and by creating policies and actions that are coherent. Again, it's like, what actions do I need to take? <clears throat> so we have security behavior analytics serves instances. And one example is, one example that is provided is K Native Security Guard. I'm I'm not familiar. I know what K Native is, but I've never interacted with it. Does anyone have some some background knowledge about K Native and the security guard? All right. Now we just have to learn on the fly, I guess. <laughs> so let's see if the if the section makes sense to us. So guard base its confidence level on changes in the external communication performed by service instances. So this is probably the learned behavior part we saw earlier. Guard evaluates the confidence level of service instances and is integrated with automation that optionally allows deleting service instances suspected as being exploited. That's cool. So we have automated and not really confinement, but like deletion. So profiling the behavior of service instances, evaluating confidence level may also take advantage of eBBF technology. And several projects are using eBBF based technology for observability, networking, security. So Falco, Cilium, Pixie, Cube Armor. The eBPF may be used to synthesize criteria describing the standard patterns used by service instances, such as criteria can later be used to evaluate the confidence level of running service instances. Anyone else know of like similar technology? Maybe you can extend the list, something that would fit the description we saw.
Yeah, so I, I, a year ago or so, I saw an introductory talk regarding Neuvector, and I think they're doing something similar. They also are deployed to Kubernetes, and they basically learn the communication patterns in your cluster, and then you can either like observe or enforce it, and you can also like review the policies. So maybe we can just leave it here as a hint. All right, adding additional source of information for determining confidence level of service instances is information. What this this sentence is breaking me. <laughs> additional source of information for determining confidence level of service instances. So information about CVEs included in the service image. I, I'm not sure. I don't feel confident. Is anyone else as confused as I am? So I, I don't get the point of this sentence. I can't really, I don't really know like what the sentence is telling me, something about CVEs should be included in the decision-making process, but not really how. All right, and uh, the next section, or maybe, do you have more to, to service instances? So this, this is basically applicable to service instances and how to secure them with this active observer pattern. And this was one example on how to implement it. Anything else for service instances to achieve that? Yeah. The next point would then be service requests. <clears throat> so service requests, transmission of service requests over the wire must be encrypted as the network cannot be trusted. Determine the risk of service, servicing the request using a service instance. Okay, to help identify compromised client identities from which the request originated. So this is tying back to what you said, Yanis, right? So how do we actually now identify that a client was compromised? And also Jack mentioned like geolocation and then other factors. <clears throat> So data in transit, first we should ensure that all communication in transit are encrypted. All services should be using TLS and all clients need to verify the server presented certificates. CNCF projects offer TLS and certificate to protect the service communication. Trying to think if this was intended to only have TLS and not mutual TLS. And they also only talk about the client should verify the server. Whereas before they were pretty clear, like we should verify in both directions. Is it because this is only talking about like service requests? So is this only one direction being considered here? It's because you can authenticate the client via multiple means, right? I think, and that's what that section below starts indicating. That's that's a good point. 
So you can have a yeah, token also. Yeah, you don't have to do MTLS, right? You do TLS and then do the other directions via other means. Okay. Then we have CNCF projects that offer this. So they mentioned Istio, Linkedd, Knative, um, also Dapper. Any other service that comes to mind that should be mentioned here? Okay, now we have the same point as before. So security behavior analytics for service requests instead of service instances. Um, okay, so Knative can actually be both used for both. Yeah, this is interesting. This this provides more background information on what guard actually is than the previous section, right? It says like security guard comes from Knative, but it can actually be used separately from Knative, which makes it a lot more interesting. God, this mention maybe through this section. Information. So guard offers the added benefit of detecting unknown exploits to unknown vulnerabilities without the use of signatures. Sounds like magic. <laughs> Someone know how they do that? Maybe it's just tying back into this patterns, right? A abnormal behavior is shut down. So an exploit. require abnormal behavior, but probably not always. That seems like a bold claim to me. As Ilian's put in the chat is some kind of behavioral analysis. Yeah. Okay. Great. A few more minutes, maybe we can gloss over the, the client identities. So we saw this a minute ago. This is then the, the, the other direction, basically identity verification. Um, Sarah uh, verifying the client. And we have different means to achieve this, right? So we have token-based identities, um, for example, JORTS, SAML, and X509, of course. And there are a lot of projects out there that help you to get this set up and bootstrapped. And then we also have the, the certificate-based identities. Um, so I'm not sure if I would agree that X509 is really token-based identity or should this be moved down here <clears throat> right. With certificate-based identities, we can do the MTLS, so server verifies client and vice versa. 
All right, coming up to the end of the session, do you have any additional points, maybe for this section or for the white paper in general? Any any thoughts you had we haven't yet uh, commented you would like to capture? All right. This is not the case. Um, I would just put the document um, in the chat um, so you can have a look in your own time if you're interested. Thanks to the anonymous scribe <laughs> taking notes. Oh, Rowan. Thanks, Rowan. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and then see you in two weeks. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.